Hey, you know, welcome to the 12th annual Global Climate and Energy Project Symposium. So it's quite extraordinary that here we are uh, 12 years later uh, with uh, at least some of the people here in the room uh, having participated uh, the entire time. So that's absolutely terrific. Um, I myself joined in 2007. Uh, and, uh, and of course, this was started by uh, Professor Lynn Orr, who's currently the Undersecretary of Energy uh, back in Washington, D.C. So, uh, you know, each year I think this symposium provides a really unique opportunity to gather a group of people together who typically don't get together. Uh, we have uh, leaders in policy, we have leaders in technology, we have NGOs, we have students. And it's a great time to be able to spend about a, a two days thinking deeply about the future of energy and grappling with issues like climate change and energy access. So, uh, so I hope that as we're here that you not only uh, enjoy the talks, but I, I hope you sort of look around. We, we set this room up with tables for the specific region that it uh, might encourage conversation. So if you're students and you're all sitting with your fellow students, you might at some point think about moving out to other tables. <laughs> Hi, students. <laughs> so anyway, well, that's terrific. So, uh, so the theme of this year's conference is deep decarbonization. And as I think back to, uh, to the origins of GSEP, our goal was always to work on the next generation of technologies in the sort of 10 to 50 year time frame. And I think in the back of our mind was always the idea that we were working on deep decarbonization because in fact there are many technologies that are uh, you know, relatively mature such as wind turbines and, and, and now even photovoltaics. So we were always looking out. And so I, I like to think that uh, you know, back in 2002 that uh, we really started on this path to deep decarbonization of the global energy system. So to set the stage for deep decarbonization, I, I want to begin with this chart that um, was prepared as part of the synthesis report for the IPCC, the fifth assessment report, that was completed in 2014. And I've been reading about climate change really since the middle of the 1990s. And, and in many cases, you know, we rely on models to forecast what we would anticipate changing, but there were often so many moving parts, so many variables, that it was difficult to sort of get to the essence of the challenge that we faced us. There are apparently so many pathways, but I think that this graph, which basically illustrates the concept that we have a carbon budget. And what we mean by is a budget is that there's only so much uh, carbon dioxide we can emit into the atmosphere before we can have a high degree of certainty about what the temperature increase will be. So that's the idea. So we have cumulative emissions since the, uh, since the uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolu Revolution. And it's plotted as a function of the temperature change. And, and there's a little red line there, uh, which is the 2 degrees C line. And we are striving globally for 2 degrees C um, to limit the temperature increase to 2 degrees C or less. And if we're going to try to achieve that, that we need to limit our cumulative carbon emissions to about 2,900 billion tons of carbon dioxide. Okay, and that will give us a 66% chance of staying less than, than uh, two degrees C warming. And so today, if we look at this budget that we have, uh, we've used up about 2,000 um, billion tons. Okay, so we've used up two thirds of that budget. And so when we think about deep decarbonization, it tells us that somehow we need to manage this energy transition with a limited capacity to put any more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So that's our target. Uh, so we can look at the history of emissions. Uh, this is a chart that was um, prepared by the Global Carbon Project. Uh, showing emissions from uh, about the 1990s to present. And today we have about 36 billion tons of carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere. And for a long time this has been rising. It was actually stable last year, but that is probably a, a temporary um, stabilization. 
But if we were to be able to never emit any more than the amount that we're emitting today, this 36 billion tons, by 2040, we will have completely used up that budget. Okay? So not only are we on the path to deep decarbonization, but there's an urgency in doing so, because unless we can begin to curve this down, turn this curve down quickly, um, we are not going to be able to achieve this. Unless, of course, we're able to take advantage of things like negative emissions, which could actually scrub carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But uh, while promising, those technologies have a long, long way to go before we could count on them for gigaton scale uh, uh, reductions in uh, carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. Okay, so, uh, so we want to get to this two degrees C or less. So what does that mean for the pace of change for carbon uh, emissions into the atmosphere? Uh, so what this chart shows us is that uh, if you look at these red, the red band there, the, the bottom one is what we would need to uh, do in terms of getting to, having assurance of remaining uh, below two degrees C. And the three degrees is shown by the second bar up there. So if we look at the, the, the light blue line that says minus 4% in emissions per year, basically it says that's what we have to do if we want to be able to achieve this 2 degree C with a 60% or 66% degree of certainty. Okay, so 4% a year. So, so what does that look like? Um, this is just a, a little simple little chart saying, okay, if we're reducing emissions by 4% a year, what will these emissions look like? And the blue curve there shows the emissions that we would need to achieve that. And if we look by 2050 or so, this is a 75% um, reduction in emissions. Now, this isn't really a new story, but I, again, I think looking to the IPCC, I think the clarity with, with which we can tell this story is even more compelling than ever. So that sets us on the path for deep decarbonization. So the question then is where? Where are all these carbon emissions? And, and this is uh, actually some data that was developed very early on in the Global Climate and Energy Project. Um, it did a couple of things. One is it sort of looked at the global energy resources from the, uh, using the concept of exergy, and which allowed us for the first time to put all the global energy resources into a single chart with a single set of consistent units so that we could really compare them apples to apples. And at the same time, for the entire global energy system, we looked at both the energy that was used and the emissions associated with that. And so this is a little chart that provides quite a bit of granularity on that. And you can see that the big, the big four are electricity, uh, heating and cooling, materials processing and manufacturing, and transportation. So these are the big four. And you can see that, um, that there are two of them that we pay a lot of attention to today. We pay a lot of attention to the electricity sector and we pay a lot of attention to the transportation sector. But you can see that even if we were to be remarkably successful in those two domains, there's still a lot of work to do on decarbonizing heating and cooling and decarbonizing material processing and manufacturing. And so, uh, again, there's a little more granularity on this, you know, in the electricity system, you know, certainly going after trying to reduce emissions from coal. Um, with regard to transportation, road and rail are, are the big ones. But if we look down into, again, some of these sectors that haven't had so much attention, uh, manufacturing, chemical production, metal purification, non-metal uh, processing, natural gas processing and refining, refining, all of these are significant targets for decarbonization. Similarly, if we look in, in the heating and cooking domain, uh, a vast variety of, of energy services that are absolutely crucial to, to the well-being of our, of our economy. So, so I bring this up to point out that we, we need to begin now to look beyond transportation and, ele and electricity if we're going to be able to achieve this 4% reduction per year. 
So last year, actually early this year, in February, we had a, a workshop with all of the GCEP sponsors. We call them the Future Vision Forum, uh, and it's a fantastic meeting where we gather together with industry and, and academic uh, uh, and students and so forth to, to talk about an issue, and we decided to talk about deep decarbonization, again, thinking about this very broad landscape. And in terms of framing this, what we developed was is the idea is that there are sort of four major uh, buckets of tools that we have for going after this, this, uh, this issue, and that if one looked after these four buckets, then could figure out, one could figure out how they apply to each of these primary emission sectors. So in terms of what are, the, what are really the knobs, what are the opportunities we have? Well, the first one is to reduce energy use by conservation. Um, there are many parts of the world where we simply probably consume too much, use too much, use too much energy, and, and, and behavior, uh, decisions, behavioral decisions can make a big difference. Um, the second one is, is that we can reduce energy use by improving the efficiency. So these are technological fixes in terms of uh, better end-use devices, better efficiency in primary energy conversions, and so forth. The third is to look at switching to lower carbon or no carbon fuels. Okay. So making that switch where we relied on, a, on a, a hydrocarbon resource today, switching to a low carbon option. So of course these are renewables, uh, uh, nuclear power uh, as, an, as an example. And I think one of the, the key words here is switch. You know, what, what we've seen historically in the global energy system is every time we find a new energy resource, we t and once it gets to be inexpensive enough, we use it. And it's fantastic, we, we go ahead and use that. But if you actually look at the trajectory, there is no energy resource that we use less of today than when we first started using it. And I know that probably comes as a, as a surprise, but even if you look at biomass, wood, you know, wood was the primary energy supply you know, back in the uh, middle of the 1800s. And you know, other forms came along, but we globally are as using as much wood for energy today as we ever did, even though many other forms have come along. So as we think about the introduction of renewables and so forth, we also have to think, are we making a switch or are we simply adding more energy to our system? Um, and the final category that we have is carbon capture and storage, that we can uh, capture the carbon dioxide from emission sources, we can, uh, we can compress it, and we can pump it back underground uh, where it's sequestered. Uh, that's the most mature approach to carbon capture and storage today, but there are certainly other people working, academics and, and researchers around the world, working on alternatives such as mineralization or even CO2 utilization, um, though that will certainly take a, a little bit longer and we have to make sure if we're utilizing that carbon that it's actually a carbon neutral cycle, that it's not just sort of a, a slightly more efficient cycle. So, okay, so these are, the, these are the four major opportunities, and so then we can look in, you know, each of these categories, and, you know, again, electricity is, is quite straightforward, we, conservation, we can educate people, we can provide incentives uh, with regard to reducing end use, or reducing um, 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 energy through efficiency improvements, there are a huge variety of end use energy efficiency improvements that can be deployed uh, through new technologies or just more efficient systems. Uh, in switching to low carbon, uh, low carbon energy sources, certainly the renewables are here today. I think if you look at wind and solar, um, you know, it's extraordinary what's happening in California. We, on a good sunny day, we're producing about 10 and a half gigawatts of, of solar energy, um, solar electricity in the middle of the daytime. Uh, that can be, you know, up to 30 to 40 percent of the total supply of the state at that moment. Um, so, so certainly those come along. And, and nuclear power, I think, is, is really struggling, but I think that in imagining a world with deep decarbonization, we, we really need to look carefully. Can we afford to let this go? What are the consequences of letting it go? And if we decide we don't want to let it go, how do we make it, how do we design markets and so forth so that it's not penalized 
uh, due to its lack of flexibility, uh, as, a, as an example. And then finally, clearly, um, carbon capture and storage could be deployed on, on coal plants equally well, especially thinking about a world with deep decarbonization, uh, deploying carbon capture and storage on natural gas plants probably makes a lot of sense, um, not only because it's actually sometimes cheaper to produce electricity that way as compared to coal plus CCS, but natural gas plants have the flexibility to, integrate, to help with the deep integration of uh, renewable energy resources. So that's an example, and, and one can walk through the, the same kind of uh, hierarchy with, with transportation. Uh, there are clearly, you know, conservation options, walking, biking. Uh, we can improve efficiency through better engines. We can electrify the transport fleet. Um, if we are using um, uh, electric vehicles, we can use wind and, the wind and sun or geothermal, you know, carbon-free sources to, to power those electric vehicles. Alternatively, we could be producing hydrogen uh, with renewable energy resources and using hydrogen in fuel cell cars. And, and one would ask, does carbon capture and storage play a role in deep decarbonization of uh, the transportation sector? And certainly, if you think about heavy-duty transportation uh, with uh, using fuel cell vehicles for, for heavy-duty transportation, certainly one of the uh, um, most well-established technologies for producing hydrogen is to do it from natural gas, and if you're sequestering that carbon uh, during the, the process of producing hydrogen, again, you have a pathway to deep decarbonization uh, based on CCS, even for the transportation sector. So, so looking uh, briefly to some of these other options in material processing and manufacturing, uh, conservation, use less stuff. You know, we've become a very materials-intensive uh, society, um, and certainly there are many people who are uh, um, being emerging from poverty who need to probably use a lot more. So, so those of us in the uh, that already have a lot, you know, I think should be thinking about conservation. Um, if we look to other, other options for material processing and manufacturing, really thinking about what's the role for hydrogen. Um, that you know there could where we need uh, where we need heat could that be provided by by hydrogen uh, if it were inexpensive enough and again finally electrification of, of manufacturing and, and um, materials processing uh, and again if we're using carbon capture and storage um, we can provide that electricity in a decarbonized way so there's a role for everything I, I don't want to, to to go there's a lot of detail here but I, I hope that you you know it, it's clear the way we're thinking about uh, the options across the board. Okay, to, so to try to you know really pull this up t together, you know, going back to the notion that a portfolio is needed, we can't simply afford to wait until we fix electricity and we fix transportation. We need to do this simultaneously. So if one were to imagine the world where we forecast future carbon emissions based on, on the energy demands that would be needed by the by, um, you know, developing world together with uh, those who already have lots of access, that we would have some baseline. And, and there's a sequence of actions. We can conserve energy, which would save carbon emissions. We can improve energy efficiency, which would save carbon emissions. We can switch to renewable energy, which would save carbon emissions. We can switch from coal to natural gas, which can reduce carbon emissions, and play, has played a really instrumental role in the success of the United States at actually having reached peak CO2 emissions uh, about uh, six or seven years ago. We can switch to electric vehicles, which improves efficiency and can result in decarbonization if you have a clean, uh, carbon, low-carbon electric grid. We can use carbon and capture and storage to further reduce emissions. We can uh, ensure a healthy nuclear fleet to reduce emissions. And then finally, we're certainly going to be needing new technologies as well, uh, a world where we have this providing all the energy services we need with 75 percent less, less emissions uh, is going to continue to create new demands on innovation in order to get there. And I highlight one, that being negative emissions, is if we can find technologies that both provide energy uh, and at the same time extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, those could be very beneficial. Uh, the most prominent example of that is something called BEX, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. 
But doing all these things alone is not going to be enough because we're going to have the enabling, we need the enabling infrastructure to achieve this. We need a, a robust transmission system to bring renewable energy from where it's plentiful to where it's needed. We need to modernize the grid to, to make both the, the supply and demand flexible so that we can uh, uh, at every moment uh, match supply and demand. We need to have a robust vehicle charging infrastructure to support electric vehicles, and, and in particular, really thinking about daytime charging, which would enable using um, the, uh, the, the, the sunlight, the, using solar energy, uh, which really you should do during the day. Um, to guide all of this, I think we need a firm foundation of techn technology and energy systems analysis. What are the best choices to make now? What will be the best choices in the future when you consider both emissions reduction potential, energy efficiency, and cost? We need to integrate all of those. Um, to support the development, particularly of new technologies, we need appropriate policies and, and financial mechanisms, and in the long run, we need a stable system that sends a clear message that we are going to go after this carbon problem. Uh, we as a carbon tax or cap and trade system that sends a very clear and, 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 and not uh, fickle uh, signal to, uh, to, to the markets that, uh, that this is something we're going to get on with. And finally, people are going to be incredibly important. People make choices about uh, what, they're, what they're going to drive, how much they're going to drive, how big their house will be, how much energy will they use for heating and cooling? So the public is absolutely important uh, to, uh, to achieve this. So, so we really need this portfolio of solutions. We need everybody to contribute. We can't wait anymore with people sitting on the sidelines. And it's, again, not just about technology, but it's finance, it's policy innovations. And, and you know, we here in groups like this need to think about inventing the future. So, uh, so that sets the stage for deep decarbonization. I'd just like to highlight a, a couple of, you know, I, I guess I would call it cool, cool science and engineering that you're going to be hearing about uh, as part of this uh, as part of this event. Uh, one of the, my favorites uh, has always been some really fan, fantastic work from uh, Professor Shanwei Fan who realized that there was an untapped energy resource that um, the, the, the resource of the darkness and, 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 and very cold temperature of space, that the Earth is actually always radiating energy out into space. And if you can devise, devise a particular device that radiates very well and that radiation is not blocked, you can actually cool something by taking advantage of this, uh, the space's three or four degrees Kelvin. And so imagine uh, being able to cool without needing an independent source of electricity. So, so you'll hear about uh, this work. And actually, we have a startup company uh, that you'll hear about that is pursuing this concept. Uh, biofuels is uh, you know, another very interesting area, particularly in the context of negative emissions. And uh, you're going to be hearing from, uh, from our team uh, from, from Princeton. Um, as well as uh, Steve Tillman, uh, looking at can we imagine a, a, an agricultural system that's both producing um, uh, biofeedstocks for energy resources, but at the same time is sequestering carbon in the soils, and how can we optimize this? And, and so you'll hear about that, a very important emerging area. Um, you're going to be hearing from uh, Professor Mike McGeehy about some really exciting new work on perovskites. You know, this has been the hot field in the solar PV area. And uh, Mike just had actually a fantastic publication uh, talking about a tandem perovskite cell that is truly exciting, and, and he'll say more about that. And then finally, you know, historically, we, GCEP was really focused on, on energy resources and, um, and energy conversions. But recently, we've had a somewhat broader view of, of our, our role, and uh, we've started some really interesting work with Professor Reinhold Duskart, looking at light weighting of uh, components, the car windshields, for example. And he'll talk about that, so some really exciting developments that could result in significant efficiency improvements in the transportation sector. 
So just uh, hopefully a teaser for some exciting things. Um, I will say I think we have an absolutely fantastic uh, set of, of plenary presentations. Uh, uh, we'll start with uh, Laurence Tubiana, who will talk about uh, COP21 and, and all of the important uh, work that was done there and, and what's next. Uh, we'll hear from uh, Gary Smith who uh, uh, from GM about uh, the future of mobility. And then we'll hear from Rishenda von Duven uh, about uh, work that she's done for a long time on energy access uh, through the, uh, the United Nations Foundation. So uh, I'm really looking forward to those. Um, we also, I think, have a treat for you in that usually when you're here, you hear a bunch of detailed presentations, you know, sort of at the very bleeding edge of, of, of science. And you, we don't sort of step back and say, well, gosh, what progress have we made? You know, we've been at this for 12 years. So we actually have four fantastic presentations which will be uh, led by, is led off by Richard Sassoon talking about sort of the impact, the scientific and engineering impact of GSEP uh, over the years. But we'll hear about chemical making, making fuels, making uh, carbon neutral fuels from Tom Jaramillo. Uh, Mike McGee, he will, will uh, give the big picture on solar. Uh, Professor Yi Shui, who's done fantastic work in storage, will talk about advancements there. Um, you know, electricity storage. And then finally, we'll hear from our Lignin team uh, about biomass energy conversion. And they've a uh, team that's worked with us now for about seven years and done a fantastic job on making some real fundamental inroads. Uh, we also have something fun uh, teed up for you. We decided as a last session that we would have an interactive debate discussion session where we'll be asking the audience questions and, and you'll be listening to what we're saying and, and basically providing feedback to us uh, in, in a way that I think will be very engaging. We've got a fantastic group of people who are going to do that. Uh, Jeff Ball uh, at our um, Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance will moderate that. So anyway, that should be very lively. I, I really encourage you to come. So. Uh, I'll be there, Bert Richter on nuclear, Dave Danielson on, on renewables and innovation, Jim Sweeney on efficiency, uh, Arun Majumdar on storage electric grid, uh, Nate Lewis talking about um, uh, um, uh, carbon negative fuels or carbon neutral fuels, and Nancy Fun talking about innovation. So anyway, that should be very lively. and. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we have our technical sessions. Uh, this is a great place to hear literally what is the latest and greatest. And we have three sessions, one on CO2 conversion to fuels and chemicals, another session on solar energy and conversion, and final one on biomass uh, conversion and transport. We also have a new feature this year. We're very excited, actually, as we've been uh, doing research and, and, and working away here. Uh, we've also uh, spawned a number of companies, uh, and in partnership with the Tomcat uh, Center for Sustainable Energy, um, what we found is, is that a lot of the, the GSEP uh, um, uh, students uh, who did their PhD studies at some point got the bug to do something with you know, making a company and, and the Tomcat program has been able to help them make that leap to, uh, to a commercial venture. And so we'll have a special showcase uh, with them uh, joining us uh, and they'll talk about what, where they are and what they're doing. And finally, uh, last but Absolutely not least is our student events. Uh, we've got our distinguished student lecturers, which always do an amazing job. Uh, they put uh, usually us faculty to shame with uh, how articulate they are. And we have a, a great poster session. Uh, we have a special lunch for uh, networking with the students and, and we have a student social. So uh, anyway, enjoy the meeting. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, thank you all for being here and, um, and uh, let's, uh, Let's go on, so thank you.